Well, this is great. Today, we welcome to the program Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg, former presidential candidate. Many in my audience will remember uh, him from that and also former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, so great to have you on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I want to jump into something substantive and meaty right away rather than wasting time. So listen, I drive a Tesla. I see Elon Musk saying crazy things on the platform formerly known as Twitter. I want to move off and move on to something different. The limitation that I and others experience is the charging network and the practicality of not having superchargers available. Talk to me a little bit about the traje trajectory and path towards equalizing what is now probably the biggest advantage for Tesla. Yeah, there's no way we're going to have tomorrow's EV fleet working on today's charging network. The president's vision is 500,000 chargers around the country. We think that's what it's going to take uh, to really have the kind of support that we need. And that's everything from having chargers spread out along long distances. And our standard is uh, at least every 50 miles, you ought to be able to count on coming to a charger. But also in communities, in areas, especially think about multifamily dwellings where maybe it's not a high income area where it pencils out for a private company to make a profit putting in a charger. Uh, we need to buy down the difference there, too. So that's what we're doing with the funding in the infrastructure law. We've got $7.5 billion going into that. Now, alongside that, the privately uh, owned and fully privately funded chargers are going to be part of that. I thought it was a good step uh, when uh, Tesla agreed to open its supercharger network uh, using adapters to uh, some other cars. Uh, we're still in a period where there are different connector standards, but you can work through that by making sure there are different connectors on chargers. And then I think the most important thing that's being missed in, uh, in a lot of the, the dialogue and debate about chargers is that most drivers, most of the time, will do most of their charging at home or at work. Again, this not is available to everybody. Uh, but ironically, it's especially true in more rural areas and suburban areas that maybe politically haven't been considered to be the early adopters of EVs. But that's where it'll be easiest because you have more people living in single family homes, more likely to have garages. And in that sense, uh, charging a car will have more in common with charging your phone for many drivers uh, than it does with filling up a gas car. So every time I talk about this, a portion of the audience says, this is really great, David, and it all sounds lovely and chargers everywhere, et cetera. But in the discussion about electric vehicles, aren't we missing the discussion about public transit? Now, putting aside for a moment that many cities have moved to electric buses and we are seeing improvements, we do have this fundamental structural issue in the United States where we have elected officials from all over the country, including very rural areas, areas where the few cities that there are are very far apart who don't see what's in it for them or their constituents and their reelection to support spending on improving public transit. What is the approach in a country laid out the way the United States to do something? I mean, listen, I, I don't know that we're ever going to be. I was in Spain. The train system is quite remarkable. Italy, France, China. I don't know that that is a reasonable goal, maybe in the next 30 years. I don't know. But how do you broach the political problem? to improve the public transit system. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. As, as proud as we are of the EV work we're doing, I actually think the most significant climate impacts of our infrastructure legislation may come from the transit side. We've got the biggest investment in public transit in US history federally, the biggest investment in passenger rail since Amtrak was created. And that's going to be critically important. And uh, I do think it's important to get out there that transit is not just about uh, a place like Manhattan. Uh, it's not just about subways. Uh, small communities, mid-sized communities can benefit hugely if their transit system is capable of, of meeting people's everyday needs. And actually whole new things have become possible in recent years thanks to things like micro-mobility. Uh, thanks to things like uh, uh, the ability to do the first or last mile, uh, e-bikes, things like that, that kind of fit into a bigger picture of mobility than we had when a lot of these transit systems and their hub and spoke models were set up in the first place. Uh, so we have to do both at once, right? We have to reduce the, the uh, environmental impact of existing modes of travel from aviation to, to driving a car. And we have to create more good options for more Americans to take more of their trips using transit. And uh, I, I think it's less about pushing people into it and more about improving the options. That means reliability. That means frequency. Uh, that means look and feel. It means the reality and the perception of safety. 
uh, in public transit. We're working all of that. And again, the, the good news is we have funding to do it. So the other piece that you mentioned is uh, trains and catching up to our peer countries in that regard. And, and, and my view, at risk of sounding nationalistic, is if a Spanish citizen or a Chinese citizen can count on high-speed rail, uh, an American citizen ought to have the same uh, options or better. Uh, obviously, that's not true right now. And no, we can't uh, overnight build uh, a high-speed rail network that's nationwide, but we can take some of the funds in the president's infrastructure package and use them to help deliver high-speed rail on American soil. And I think if we have it, even in just a handful of geographies in the US, seeing is believing, and it will pave the way, so to speak, for more people to expect and demand it as an option alongside air travel, alongside uh, vehicle travel, uh, to get to where you need to be in this country. So you talked about design, experience, feel, all of these different things. I'm curious what your view is or as a representative of the of the Biden administration, what the view is on the role of the private sector in public transit. And the context of this is that for all of my many criticisms of Tesla and Elon Musk, they did put pressure on the legacy manufacturers to much more quickly start bringing these electric vehicles to market rather than to slow play it and necessarily suck every dollar out of internal combustion engines. So is there a role in I don't know if it's the Hyperloop or whatever other example, but what do you think the role of private industry should be in public transit? Uh, well, I think that uh, any time a new technology comes along or uh, a, a new approach comes along, that can really transform transit in a way that's beneficial. Uh, and sometimes that, that comes with some healthy pressure to keep up, uh, whether that's something like a Hyperloop concept or uh, it has to do with what, what I consider to be the most disruptive transportation technology the last 15 years, which is actually not a vehicle, it's the smartphone. Uh, there are lots of things that have come along that do change the possibilities for transit. And I'm especially interested in, in things that can, uh, in some small to middle density communities, really replace the need for a uh, kind of hub and spoke system with very few uh, riders that, that can cost, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 bucks per passenger per ride in terms of the system uh, with something that, that is still part of transit, but a little more nimble, a little more adaptable, a little more likely to be on demand. Uh, I've seen places like Kansas City uh, working with uh, technology to introduce that. And I think in the near term, that's very exciting. Uh, it may be that, uh, that, that, that transit will look different and operate uh, differently in all but the uh, biggest, densest cities that are uh, of a scale to support a subway. Um, and we should lean into that and support it. When it comes to electric generally, so this is vehicles, but also personal vehicles, but buses, et cetera. I'm curious whether in terms of the conversations you're having with people, you currently see electric as a bridge fuel source or technology maybe to hydrogen or something else, or whether you actually see it as a potential endpoint for a longer period of time? So I think a, a slight but valid simplification here is the bigger the vehicle, the more you're going to see a diversity of uh, fuel and propulsion sources for the future. Now, there's hmm. light duty vehicle uh, uh, car. Uh, I really think that EVs are going to be the, the way that these things work for the next century. Again, the advantages of many people being able to uh, easily charge them at, at home or at work. It's what Chaston and I do. We have a plug-in uh, hybrid electric minivan. Never thought I'd be a minivan person. Then we had to, we had twins and, and life changed. Uh, we just plug, we don't even have, we, we should probably get one. We don't even have one of those uh, level two chargers. We just literally plug it into the wall. Yep. And I think a lot of Americans don't realize that's already possible for, for many of them. Uh, so it's hard to beat that. And the other advantage of electric is it actually gets less carbon intensive over time because the uh, generation mix of this country is growing in terms of renewable energy. So however much cleaner it is than gas today, uh, that actually improves even with the same car. Uh, year after year. But as you get into uh, some of the heavier duty vehicles, as you get into uh, uh, semis, uh, buses, look, we see uh, a lot of really great uh, zero emission vehicles right now that are electric. But I do think it's in that uh, field that you're going to see other zero emission technologies demonstrating their competitiveness and potentially really duking it out over the decades to come with electric technology to see what's best. So I want to talk about the decades to come in the context of jobs. Transportation is also one of the biggest job sectors in the United States. I recently saw I don't know if you heard or saw this 
it looked like a union rally, but it was at a non-union shop with non-union people holding signs that said union members for Trump. You know about this event I'm talking about. We know. So you notice. So there was an interview done of a guy who who knows who he was, because at this point it's unclear who anybody was at that event. But what he said was that one of the concerns among auto workers working in internal combustion engines is that electric vehicles kill jobs because the engines are so simple, they require far fewer workers. Now, in the research I've done, the long term of this is quite the opposite, that between battery technology, grid upgrades, pressure on more renewable sources for the electricity used to charge the cars. There's five or six different areas where jobs are actually going to be created by the move to EVs. What is the data or the perspective on this that that you're seeing as someone who's embroiled in it daily? Yeah, we do see a lot of evidence that this will open whole new frontiers in manufacturing jobs. Yes, manufacturing the vehicles themselves and their supply chains, uh, but also manufacturing chargers, uh, which uh, need to be made in America per the rules that that uh, President Biden made sure we laid out. Uh, you know, we have strong Buy America policies on uh, pretty much anything that that is funded with taxpayer dollars. You mentioned batteries. That's part of why the UAW is fighting so hard right now. They see uh, the battery side as a very important part of this picture and want to make sure there's good pay and working conditions there. The other thing that I think is really important strategically is even if all of that weren't uh, certain to come, it doesn't mean that uh, there's an option of just uh, trapping people in the old technologies forever. Uh, remember, the, these uh, EVs, these new technologies, they're, they're not just better for the environment, they're better for the consumer. People are switching to them. Uh, their, their share of sales has tripled, and as costs come down, it'll uh, probably grow even more quickly uh, because they're cheaper to fuel, cheaper to maintain, last longer, uh, and perform better. Uh, so if, you know, I, I always think about one of the uh, companies, one of the bygone companies of my hometown, South Bend, which is famous for producing Studebaker uh, cars, but also used to be famous for producing a kind of a pocket watch uh, called South Bend Watch. It, the, the very brand name was a byword for, uh, for quality in the 1920s. They wound up making some of the very best pocket watches of the early wristwatch age, but they didn't figure out wristwatches would be a thing in time. They went out of business right around the time of the Great Depression. Uh, the, the surest way to destroy the American auto industry and American auto jobs would be to pretend that technologies of the 50s, 60s, and 70s are going to keep us going into the 2030s and 2040s. It's just not an option. In the few minutes we have left, I want to shift gears a little bit, and I'm sensitive to the fact that you're here as Secretary of Transportation and not in any connection with a campaign. I want to talk a little bit about two of the people that I think are striking the best tone in general when it comes to talking about these issues, whether it's part of a campaign or not. We'll just make it general. Are you and Gavin Newsom in terms of recognizing the bad faith with which many on the right are currently approaching issues of transportation, issues of climate, issues of economics, et cetera? You seem remarkably well prepared to handle the attack sandbaggings from whether it's Fox News or whether it was the other day over your flight records or the difference between it's now fall versus climate change, or, you know, all of these different moments. How much, how precisely, this is a tactical question, do you and your staff anticipate the exact nature of the sort of sandbaggy questions you're going to get? You know, some of the stuff you can see it coming, uh, but the, <laughs> the truth is there, there, there's always a surprise. Um, I would just say House Republicans in particular, as they've demonstrated this week, are always full of surprises. I did not in a million years prepare for the idea that a sitting member of Congress would propose that the seasons changing was the same thing as the climate changing. And yeah. then I saw another uh, of his House colleagues double down on that a few days later. She basically said the same thing. Uh, just I don't have the imagination to uh, to see things like that coming. Uh, but what we do know is that there are certain patterns that hold, uh, including a, a pattern of being uh, incredibly uh, uh, skeptical or making a show of being skeptical of a new technology uh, like EVs while uh, seeming to be willing to make any excuse to, to use all of the instruments of, uh, uh, of the U.S. government to prop up oil and gas profits was the kind of subsidies that uh, uh, they support in the very same uh, uh, session as they'll turn around and say when it comes to something like EVs that uh, you know there should never be a subsidy related to transportation. Uh, you, you can see some of those patterns unfold around you. 
Uh, and you know, we can also see that this isn't going to age well. I mean, I, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be one of these members, maybe one of the younger members of, uh, of the Republican conference uh, that, that I saw at that committee meeting, 20, 30 years from now, explaining to their grandchildren why they did everything they could to fight to keep uh, us burning the maximum amount of fossil fuels for the longest time possible. I just can't imagine what it would be like. It's, it's uh, inconceivable. And, and yet there they are, right? And some of them, I think a lot about the fact that I'm gonna have to look my kids in the eye when they're old enough to ask some pretty tough questions about how we handled the moments in front of us in the 2020s and better have some good answers. And I think hey, speaking, the, uh, speaking of kids, before I let you go, a father to father, any bedtime tips? Because my 16 month old is very shaky on the sleep. <laughs> we are probably in very similar territory and nobody's fully cracked the code on that. I, we, uh, uh, I, I find it changes every every few days or weeks in terms of which one of the twins is a better sleeper or which one puts up more resistance at bedtime. Um, I mean, some of the sweetest moments are actually when you're trying to put them bed, but, uh, to bed, but uh, uh, they don't make it easy, do they? No, it's less sweet at 3.15 a.m. is what I find in my experience. <laughs> uh, Mr. Secretary, we've been speaking with the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Really appreciate your time uh, and your insights today. Same here. Great speaking with you. I appreciate it.